Gareth's Story Planet. Hello and welcome to Gareth's Story Planet and I have got a treat for you today. I am joined by an amazing and inspirational author, Jonathan Emmett. Hi Jonathan. Hiya. Jonathan has written over 60 picture books uh, and mid-grade books and he's an award-winning author and an all-round lovely guy. So let's crack off. How did and why did you um, decide to become a writer? Um, do you know, I get asked this by kids all the while and, and I'll tell you the same answer I would tell them. Um, which was that um, I've always liked sort of playing with ideas. I think I started wanting to be a writer when I was at junior school, um, uh -huh. but I didn't really sort of realise that it was a proper job. Um, but I was certainly writing stories at junior school. I often credit one teacher in particular. I had a teacher called Miss Morphew. And uh, I think probably in about year four at junior school, we spent an hour a week doing creative writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody else in the class would write a new story every week. They would sit down and create a new piece of work and you'd get from beginning to end. And, um, and I'm always a bit wary about say, admitting this, but I was a big Enid Blyton fan at that time, as many That's people great. in my generation were. <laughs> and um, and uh, I wanted to write a long story like The, the Faraway Tree or The Wishing Chair. Oh, nice. and, um, and so I asked her if I could write, instead of writing a, a, a new story every week, I could write a new chapter every week and you were and, so ambitious and, and get to a kind of cliffhanger ending to start the following week and um, and she let me do that and I think that's one of the things that kind of got my brain fermenting on when I was about 30 years old um, the practice I was working in is in the middle of a, the second um, sort of big recession we had in the building industry I got laid off and um, it, it, it was a third wave of redundancies in the practice and I just thought you know, I, I all of the jobs that had were there had gone, and I thought I'm going to pursue this dream of being a children's writer. Amazing. And um, basically, it gave myself, well, my wife and I gave myself a year because she was prepared to, um, um, you know, sort of support me uh, to do that and to start a family. So I sort of became a children's writer and a stay-at-home dad, pretty much um, like um, you are, Gareth. <laughs> you are me in a few years' time. Um, uh, and um, and uh, very, very fortunately, um, uh, uh, back, well, back then I, I, I approached um, uh, about six agents and two of them, well, four of them said, I'm not interested, as very familiar story with a lot of people trying to get yeah. going. But two of them said that um, they would interview me and the very first one that interviewed me was a woman called Gina Pollinger who I didn't really know much about at the time until I was actually sitting in her office. And I remember seeing in her office and, and, and seeing um, and realising that she was Walt Dahl's agent and Jacqueline Wilson's agent. And, and, wow. Um, wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, fortunately, by the end of that interview, I, I'd come up with a prototype pop-up book. It's been a month, a month between seeing her and being made redundant. I'd made my first prototype pop-up book um, uh, called Here Be Monsters, which is a type I've since reused as a picture book. I love this book, by oh, the way. Right. It I is one of my favourites. The pop-up book is quite different. Um, uh, but I, I produced that and I took that to show Gina and she didn't have any other paper engineers. So it was quite a departure for her. Oh, okay. And she said she would keep the prototype for a week and um, show it to publishers. And then based on their responses, she would decide whether she took me on. And she did take me on. And, um, and then about 18 months later, she retired. So I was very fortunate to get in un under the wire and then passed me to my <coughs> current agent, who's a, a lady called Caroline Walsh, who is brilliant um, and is very Amazing. much, um, you know, been hugely instrumental in me. Typically, how do you start to write a new picture book? What is your journey to creating a book? Um, well, usually, I mean, uh, the kind of inspiration part, you know, it, it, there's never one set route, you know, for how you get the inspiration. So um, quite commonly, when my kids were little, I used to get a lot of inspiration from things that they said. So yes, um, I, I to, totally get that. Yeah, I, and, and make the most of that while they're small. <laughs> I, I, you know, because now I'm sort of like, oh, so my son just reads books about political theory, and I'm not going to get any ideas from that. You know, mm, yeah, so, it doesn't leap but, off the picture book page. Exactly. Um, so um, you know, so quite often, so the. Uh, a couple of books, um, both about pigs, in fact. One was called Pigs Might Fly. Yeah. Um, it was, was based on a conversation I had with my son coming home from school about a story that he'd written about the three little pigs at school. And I basically stole that story, Amazing. modified it, 
And you know, we, as we walked home, and I, I tended to do this a lot as I've, as I I've picked them up from the school, we would, you know, if they came up with an idea for the story, we'd effectively workshop it on the way home. Okay. And um, so that came that way. And then similarly, <coughs> when my daughter, who's five years younger, and that's a good tip, you know, if you're going to use your kids as a resource, try and space them far out apart, and then you get a longer time when you can mine them. Mm. Um, my I daughter, didn't plan yeah, that yeah, in no. advance. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't actually plan it, unfortunately. But my daughter was five years younger, and um, she was um, uh, picking her up from nursery, as it was at the time, and she saw a piggy bank in a shop window that was um, looked like a princess, and she pointed at it and said, Princess Pig, Daddy! And um, uh, I thought it was just such a funny idea. And so again, we talked about, you know, why a princess would become a pig. And by the time we'd got home, much to my daughter's annoyance, I decided that the funniest story would be about a real pig yeah. that somehow got mistaken for a princess. And that also the thing that annoyed my daughter was that at the end of the story, the, um, the, the, the real princess, as it were, would stay with the poor farmer's family rather than, I'm, I'm a bit of a Republican, rather than the royal family in the story. And all <coughs> of that had taken place in the time that we'd walked home. Other books wow. can be different. You know, so yeah. sometimes, you know, the whole thing is, comes quite quickly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, you can sort of get it all out of your head and it's more or less right. Other times it can literally take, you know, a year or so to actually get the story to, to sort of be to the final sort okay. of um, the final draft. But like everybody else, like every good writer, I'd imagine, I do loads and loads of drafts. You know, it's one of the things that you have mm. to be prepared to do to get yeah, a really yeah. good story is to accept the first time you write it down, it's not going to be as good as it could be and to keep going back and revisiting and redrafting. Yeah. I'm and telling you to suck eggs here. No, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> to be honest, I, I still have to, you know, remember that. But yeah, you're right. It, it Sometimes it takes me months and months. Uh, I then put it away and then go back to it. It's not quite right. I edit it, send it to my agent. She gives me notes. Yeah then hopefully it will find a publisher and then you get notes for them. Yeah. And it continues right up Absolutely. once the, the yeah. images have been drawn as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's madness. But I I love that. I'm I'm from a theatre background which is totally collaborative. So and you are working in collaboration with lots yeah. of different people. And I and I th I think it's great. And do you have a bottom drawer full? I'm, I'm not trying to pinch any, but do you have a bottom drawer full of stories? I, I do. I mean, it tends to be a computer file. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I, um, you know, uh, and as I was just sort of we were chatting prior to, it, to the interview, I was saying that, you know, quite often some of the stories that, that I wrote, in one case, um, Alphabet Street, a, a novelty book that I you know, came up with 20 years ago, um, wow. uh, you know, had just got published um, uh, the UK edition came out a uh, year before last and uh, with some of those bottom stories I do I do still keep taking them out and um, you know reassessing whether I think that they're good stories and sometimes you take them out and you just cringe because you think oh that's yeah. really badly done and you know how could I think this was you know suitable for publication um, but sometimes you take them out and you think, oh, this is still really good. And usually what I'll do then is I'll do a quick Google to see if anybody else has done something similar. I do uh, that too. Particularly with titles. Do you know what I mean? Yes, no, I, I do that. That's another place where I get um, story ideas from. Quite often I just get a, a, what I think is a strong title. And it doesn't necessarily end up as the title of the book, but it gives me the idea of the story. So um, there's a book I've written which has three different titles. In the UK it's called... Um, Ruby Flew 2 in yeah. uh, in the US it's called Ruby in Her Own Time but the first oh. UK hardback edition was called Once Upon a Time Upon a Nest and that title mm. gave me the book um, so um, so I will Google the title yeah, if, I, if I've got you know, a story that's really kind of hinges off the title um, and Alphabet Street was like that actually because there's the Prince song and I, I, I thought, I okay, can't believe okay. nobody has done. I think there's a website called Alphabet Street now that came out after the book came out. But I thought, nobody's done a book called Alphabet Street. You know, so that was one of the things that made me, um, you know, think oh, this one is definitely worth sending out again. And uh, it was picked up by a publisher. It was picked up by Nosy Crow. Um, uh, but Camilla, the editor at Nosy Crow, I think had looked at it previously. Um, when she was at um, uh, Macmillan or probably Campbell Books okay. um, and liked it but kind of felt, mm, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to work and you know finally it sort of works so sometimes that's the thing is that you know you get you get close with a book and you've got an editor that really <coughs> likes it but they can't get it past yeah, the yeah, rest yeah. of the company 
And the thing about publishing, as you'll soon learn, is it's kind of like musical chairs. The editors move around quite a bit mm. from company to company. And, you know, sometimes you'll get an editor that will move to another company or yeah. they'll be working with a certain illustrator and they'll be looking for a certain type of book and they'll think, oh, that book that Gareth sent me a couple of years ago that I really wanted. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, uh, that kind of, it's almost like trying to pick a lock. You need to get all of the chambers lined up properly and, and sometimes just an editor moving from one to the other is, is the way that you... Uh, That's an interesting yeah, analogy. I yeah. like that, picking yeah. a lock, trying to get it right. Yeah. It's actually happened to me. One, one of my editors mm. from a publishing house has moved to, to somewhere else. So, fingers crossed, I'll get to work with them again uh, but yeah musical chairs I, I definitely agree so thinking back to um, your, your development of, of writing who were some of your book writing idols um, well certainly from a very young age I mean I, I suspect a lot of writers do this is that they start off looking at the people that really kind of you know, engaged them as a child so uh, Maurice Sendak Where the Wild Things Are is still one of my favourite books Love it's it. the book Amazing. one book in the library when I was a kid that had scary monsters in it. And this is kind of a bit of, uh, it's one of the things I get on my soapbox about is that I think we're a little bit too reluctant to acknowledge that children like scary material. And I, uh, children of both sexes like scary material, but boys in particular, I think it's one of the reasons why we have a gender gap. Okay. Um, is yeah. that we don't necessarily, you know, respond to some of the things that boys in particular, not exclusively, find appealing. Um, so that you know that that was one of those books that just absolutely stood out, and I must have borrowed it from the library. I never had any picture books as a child. Um, I think uh, my mum uh, didn't think they were worth. We did have <coughs> books in the house. It wasn't one of those families. We had quite a lot of books in the house, but um, uh, I think my mum didn't think they were worth spending the money on. Um, uh, uh, and so I used to borrow that from the library, and it's one of the things that's made me, you know huge fan of libraries because I realised I wouldn't be doing what I was doing now if I didn't have a decent library when I was a kid. So where the wild things are. And then um, I didn't discover this until I was probably a teenager, but I also love another book by Maurice Sennett called In the Night Kitchen, um, which has this... Oh, oh, I don't well, know that. Definitely find it out. In fact, there's, you can, your viewers will be able to see it, but there's a picture from the night kitchen up on the wall there. Um, it's this incredibly surrealist story um, uh, th about this little boy who effectively... He's asleep. He falls through the floor into what in, into this landscape okay. called the night kitchen, which is made out of huge um, kitchen utensils and and flower jars and things like that. It's like skyscrapers, but they're all scale. Amazing. And then and then he meets in the night kitchen three chefs who all look like Oliver Hardy from Lowell and Hardy. Okay. Okay. No explanation is given of this, uh, and um, and they mistake him for milk. For the for the bread that I know the whole thing is utterly surreal and, wow. and I remember talking to my kids both loved this book and they just totally accepted the surrealness of it. I remember reading it to a child who was about ten and she said, "Well, it just you know, doesn't make none of it makes any sense." Uh, and I was saying, "But that's why I like it's one of the few books that has a dream in it." absolutely captures dream logic perfectly well my, my dream logic dream anyway. logic okay, so okay. you know that that things kind of you know that they, they, they've got their own it's sometimes there's an internal logic to it and it's just beautifully drawn the line work in it and, and the line works quite different from where the wild things are so that's definitely one the other two okay, people okay. that i should mention um uh, dr zeus i just adore dr zeus lifelong yeah, fan yeah, big yeah. influence still um yeah, yeah. I, my um how the Balks became book about evolution was you know, I was just looking at Dr. Zeus, I genuinely thought I'm going to try to write a Dr. Zeus style book that teaches evolution. That was the brief for that book for me. And it's great. It's and a really good book. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, and then the last one, who is less well known, um, is uh, a, an American author illustrator. They, they were all American author illustrators. I realised that my library was full of American oh. picture books. I didn't really like many of the, the UK picture books that kind of other people in my generation was reading. But um, the last one's a guy called Crockett Johnson. Okay. Um, who wrote a series of books about Harold and the Purple Crayon, uh, which is a, a magic crayon, and whatever you draw with it, you, you, have you heard of Crockett Johnson? I, I know the, the Purple Crayon. The Purple Crayon. Well, whatever you yeah. draw with the Purple Crayon becomes real, and they're really visually mm. witty, um, uh, because, like, for instance, there's one point where he draws a monster, and he it's so scary, the monster he draws, that he backs away from it, and his hand is trembling, and his hand is trembling, it draws waves on a sea and he suddenly finds himself in, in the water. Bye bye.